as you jump in, if you want to participate by just throwing in an answer to this question, we'll shape some of our content around. So we got another one, which is organizational alignment. You see the directions are right there in the middle. You can go link in the chat and you can respond there. And we're about to get going. I think so leadership's desire for command and control metrics, org interest in speed of implementation, training, hopefully lack of training, not the training was terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've seen both of those. So. Ah, lack of training, yeah. All right, cool. Leadership education, yeah. So now a combination of lack of leadership support yeah so I, I always love the uh yeah y'all go be agile but like you know you, what's going to be in it and what's the date <laughs> you know like the the behaviors aren't changing right so definitely see a leadership theme um and uh education theme so we'll try and connect some things to what y'all seen there uh, I'm David Hawks, uh, CEO of Path to Agility, and um, my background is uh, I started a transformation company about 12 years ago, and um, we have been at this game of helping organizations through their transformation, uh, built Path to Agility along the way, and, uh, and we're going to kind of share how we think Path to Agility can uh, really uh, help your safe implementations and and um, really help guide them in a, a kind of like think about it as like safe on steroids, maybe in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> um, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Cusson. I am a transformation coach and I've been working with David for a few years now. I've uh, been doing transformations for many years. Um, Started my career early on in small companies, lots of uh, tech startups, things like that, and then started doing a lot more uh, bigger uh, financial services, insurance companies, things like that, and started um, really scaling up the transformations. And so I think a natural progression was to move into safe. So you have quite a bit of uh, safe experience uh, and seeing where those uh patterns are great and and where they're challenging and been trying to help uh, clients for years kind of navigate through the safe big picture and find uh, the path forward that's that's going to help them um, to get to where they need to be and uh, yeah that's my background yeah so we've got about 30 minutes of con 30 to 40 minutes of content here um happy to answer questions the best way uh, to do that we're using the webinar version of zoom so um, you should see a q a button at the bottom and um so that's the best way to submit questions and then we'll kind of triage those as we go and then we'll have some time at the end to to wrap up with any questions that we have so i i think many uh or i know i know some people maybe Many of you that have signed up were um, also heard about this at the Safe Summit. So one of our favorite stories you heard about at the Safe Summit with uh, Southwest Airlines, and um, and so some of the things that we'll share today are some of those practices that we used um, with with uh, with Marty's organization um, that uh, you heard some of the story about. And uh, and then we continue to work with them today. So we'll share some of those uh, those stories and um, and walk through some of this the content here. So let's jump right in. Um, so one of the things that we see is our what are we what are we measuring when we think about um, as we start to adopt agile practices, safe practices. And one of the things we see is people getting a little over ratcheted around the practices versus the the outcomes uh, that we want to achieve. So, um, Eric, tell us a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, so I think SAFE gets a little bit of a bad rap sometimes because there's so much stuff in here and there are so many uh, different uh, areas that uh, are being utilized and, and things that are happening in the industry and thought leadership and experts in different fields. And they're pulling all this together. It's a lot of really good stuff. And it can also be a little overwhelming. And I think if people um, often look at this as, well, we have to do all of the things. And so a lot of people start either here or they will look at the implementation roadmap and they start there. And this is where we want to get our transformation going. And that's fine. All of these things are, are valid. These are, these are great things to go and do. But uh, I think this ties in with some of the comments we saw early on as everyone was joining on some of the challenges that we're seeing uh, get reflected in here and, and in, in an unintentional way. But leadership and sponsors and the people who are writing the checks for the Agile transformation and all the coaches and the training and all of that, they look at this and it, it turns into a lot of activities. And so there's usually a desire to get moving, show progress quickly. And that takes the form of, well, what are the visible things that we can see? And those are the activities. So rather than, um, you know, people want to feel like progress is being made. And so it really tees up um, a recipe for a potential disaster when uh, you're just doing a lot of activity rather than actually understanding uh, what, what are the outcomes? Like, why are we doing this? What's important to us? How are we going to get there? And really linking these, to, the, these together. So going off and doing all of those activities, I'm not suggesting we don't do those activities and follow the roadmap and do things like training is super important and launching trains and value stream mapping. But doing all of those things in and of themselves does not guarantee any uh, business outcomes. And I'm sure some of you are probably part of a struggling transformation. If you've been doing this long enough, you've seen lots of, of um, veneer of agility, but you're not actually hitting those business outcomes. You're not making your, your business more uh, resilient. Yeah. And we, and we saw the same pattern a decade ago, or even 15 years ago, where uh, pretty safe and everything was kind of like scrum, right? And so we saw the same pattern where a lot of people were implementing scrum and then not really getting a lot of the benefits that it promised at a team level. But then when you really dug into it, you just saw that like, all right, we're going through all the motions. Like you, we've probably all seen the team where the team is, you know, hey, we we meet, we do sprint planning, we check, we have a retrospective check, we have a sprint review check, we have a scrum master check, we have a product owner check, but we don't deliver, we, you know, but it takes us six months to get something out the door, right? Like, so yeah, we're going through the motions, but we're not necessarily working with more agility. And we're seeing that same pattern of kind of, I call that like either cargo cult or mimic, you like you were mimicking but we don't necessarily have the depth of understanding that ties into some of the training things that y'all saw, you know, so it's more like, do we really understand the why behind it? And there's so many things to consume within safe that we, we see a lot of mimicking of, all right, we have an art, we have an RTE, we, we have our teams working in, in sprints. We are planning every, every, you know, quarter basically, but we might not be we might be just as waterfall as we ever were, right? But we're but we're using all the new terms and we're using all the same structures. So just because we're doing the things doesn't mean we're achieving the outcomes that we're after. So what we look at with path to agility is we start with the outcomes first and defining those, like defining the why of our, why are we adopting all this stuff? If, if your company's goal right now is to do safe and that's the objective of the year is to implement safe. We had uh, a, another customer who uh, once said like their number one metric for success of their transformation was we we're gonna launch 20 arts this year. It's like, great. You know, and at the end of the year, they they checked all those boxes and they had 20 arts stood up, but they didn't achieve faster delivery, right? Like that would have been a better goal, right? We want to get more value out the door faster. 
Now let's apply all the things that we need within SAFE, and maybe not all of the things, maybe apply the right things within SAFE to achieve that goal. So I want to do a little exercise with you. I'm going to switch over here if I can get my alt tab to work correctly. Um, I'm going to copy a link. I'm going to put a link in the chat for you all to play along. And this is a tool we call Path to Agility Navigator. And I'm going to give each of you three votes. And what I want you to do is on your screen, you have the ability to click on these, uh, these business, what we call the nine business outcomes. So you can start to select what are the three business outcomes that you think for your organization would be the most important reason for you to uh, Imp, you know, do the safe thing, right? Like implement all these things that are in here. We're doing that for hopefully a good reason. What is that reason? What would be the, the three things you might pick? And I'll give us uh, a minute here. I see they're changing behind the scenes as the votes are kind of coming in. Uh, I see six, uh, six people have voted, um, seven of you are in. So again, there's a link in the chat. Um, love for everybody to play along. And um, you can just click on that, and then you should see an ability to just click on the cards that are there. A um, few more seconds. I see some, still some vote moving happening behind the scenes, but I'll reveal this in, let's see, 10, 9, 8, 7. All right, I see 12 of 12, so I'm going to go ahead and close the voting. Oh, somebody must have just changed their answer. All right. Here's where we ended up, um, is that you see the little blue numbers. So we got a tie for first between predictability, speed, and customer satisfaction. Um, and uh, our loser today was continuous improvement. But what, you know, what we're going to show you is how do we start connect? How do we start with business outcomes and, and ultimately get to practices, but the practices should come kind of last, like the implementation should come after the why and the what. Um, where we think most uh, transformations are actually getting this wrong. They're starting with the, the how and the practices and then hoping that they get the why, right? Um, so this is an activity that you could use with your leaders to try and get clarity of what's that mission and what's that goal. Uh, typically, we would have facilitate a conversation to try and narrow it down to, you know, what are our top three or even what's our top like number one. Um, and then we would encourage you to work with those leaders to turn that into a clear objective with clear measures of success, right? So if we said speed is our number one goal, then how are we going to measure that? Are we measuring our cycle time, are we measuring, you know, like I've had one client where they said, our goal, uh, we, we're not measuring it today. So first goal is every team is measuring it. Uh, second goal, we don't have a baseline. So instead of saying we need everybody to have a 20% improvement, we're just going to say uh, every team is showing improvement. Right. And that actually created a healthier kind of environment of, all right, we want every team to be able to measure their their cycle time and every team to show that they're improving their cycle time. And that was their mission for the year. Right. And so that but doing this activity helped them get clarity of that mission. One one quick add here as well. This doing this activity really helps change the conversation in a positive way because it. Yeah. What we saw in some of the early comments as you all were, were joining are things that that really show where leadership might not have a full understanding of what this is. There's lots of, again, activities, focus on activities. And a lot of, you know, a lot of leaders tend to think, well, we're just implementing a new process. So go implement the new process. Let me know when you're done. Uh, meanwhile, I have a business to run. This really changes the conversation around uh, getting their mindset around what are we actually doing for the business. And it you can start to test which leaders are really engaged and which are not uh, and change the conversation in a fundamentally different way that, that helps get them hopefully where you want them to be. Right. Because if you're having a conversation about safe, your senior leaders, your business leaders, they don't really care. Right. They don't care if we're doing agile, safe, less, dad, waterfall. They don't really care. But this they'll engage in this conversation, 
what do we need to get better at from a business perspective? So encourage you to start and reshape the conversation there as a way to get those leaders engaged um, in a, as, and also to get a clear North Star of the why and a clear North Star of how we're going to measure success. So let me go back to uh, the slides here. So here's, here's a pattern that we've seen. We've been doing this poll for um, almost seven years, seven, yeah, seven years now, asking organization, what level of agility do you have? And we already, I already kind of described superficial agility, you know, where we're like going through the motions, but we're not, um, you know, we're, we're not actually like getting better. Um, but we also have this like 50% that are stuck in improving and they're trying to do it, but like something's not happening. And some of the issues that y'all highlighted earlier, I think somebody had like the organizational structure one in there. And that's a big one. Like, are we just putting, uh, you know, like building an agile release train on top of the existing organizational structure, or are we actually doing value stream, uh, you know, analysis to determine the right system of teams, right? The right alignment to value, to minimize dependencies, to align with the business. Um, and a lot of times that's a sticking point is that we're not actually making the organizational shift that allows us to get to a more predictable or faster delivering organization. And so, um, you know, that's one of the challenges that we're, we're seeing is when we focus just on the doing, doing all the practices, we get stuck because we don't persevere through to try and achieve this like, oh, we're trying to go after speed. Well, if speed's the thing we're after, then we need to make organizational changes in order to achieve that goal, as opposed to a different conversation of we're implementing safe. Do we need to change the organization to implement safe? Well, we could just wrap our teams into an art like this. And that doesn't necessarily achieve the goal that we're after. Yeah, one, one quick example on improving agility that I see quite often is uh, at the end of the PI, you're doing your inspect and adapt workshop, and maybe you have a you know, great RTE who's doing a good job of facilitating, and you're doing all of this uh, root cause analysis, and you've got some really great stuff popping up, but you don't have key leaders in the room to hear it firsthand. They don't see how hard the art is working toward making those improvements, and they're not actively engaged in taking on those organizational impediments. Well, linking back to the conversation around business outcomes, if say customer satisfaction was your North Star and you can point to things that are uh, impeding progress toward that goal, again, helps change the conversation, helps you get the right leaders in the room and, and gives them something to connect to when they step into the room that's meaningful for them. Yeah. So if we complete that honeycomb picture... We, we, with Path to Agility, we started to outline kind of the middle here. In the middle, what we see is identifying what are the capabilities we're trying to develop in the organization to achieve the business outcome that we're after, and then figuring out what practices we need to support that. So starting with those business outcomes like speed, and then saying, in order to do that, we need to be able maybe to deliver more predictably as a team so that then we can optimize the speed or we need uh, capability to actually shorten our quality feedback loop through things like test automation, um, or we need to uh, tighten up like our requirements type of process because that's where we're spending a lot of time or deployment or whatever those new capabilities we need to build. And then, Let's go figure out what are all the, you know, what are the right practices to support that? Um, and so what, that's what we're going to dig into next is kind of how do we look at things from a capability-based assessment? Um, and, and we do that with Path to Agility. So um, some of you have seen this, this picture. Um, if you stop by the booth at Safe Summit or you, you've seen some of our previous webinars, um, I just want to hit on it really quick, just in case there's some folks that hadn't seen this before. These are what we call the five stages of an agile transformation and path to agility. And a line is around aligning around a why and a reason for change, getting a clear North Star, because this is, you know, we've all seen the change curve before. It's going to be a difficult path. 
Um, learn is about creating a learning culture. Are we having meaningful retrospectives and improving, not just at the team level, but at like the, the agile release train level and the organizational level? Are we removing organizational impediments? Are we learning how to be a more agile organization to get to a stage of more predictability? We believe predictability has to come before accelerate or speed because if we're not very predictable and we say go faster, like we're just putting more noise in the system. So a lot of times that predict, we'll talk about scale by descaling, by simplifying the system of teams. Um, and so by attacking sources of volatility, we can get more predictable. And then once we're more predictable, then we can optimize the whole from concept to cash and accelerate to delivering faster. And then adapt is about sensing and responding quickly to what the market is demanding and being an adaptable organization based on how the market is shifting. And then we look at also things in another dimension, which we call uh, the team system and organizational dimension and these levels. Um, team is just your normal agile team system. Think about that as like agile release train, or we call the system of teams or the system of value delivery through like a team of teams. Um, but we in, in safe, we, we wrap that up in typically an, an agile release train. And then um, and then we but we also have an organizational lens and from a leadership perspective, finance practices, HR practices, uh, new job architectures, because we're creating new roles, but also that organizational structure. So we believe you can't transform at only one of these levels, right? You've got to transform at all levels. Um, because they all are interdependent on each other, right? We can't just say, all right, go change all the teams, but we're going to keep operating the same way at the system level, or just try and change the system. We've seen this where we apply safe at the system, but we don't actually have good agile practices at the team level, right? Which doesn't, doesn't work either. Or we're doing things at the system and team level and our, and the things that y'all typed in in the beginning but the leadership's not shifting. We're not changing our behaviors or our, our mindset organizationally. We're still managing in a very like project heavy, project funding based way um, instead of implementing like lean portfolio management practices at the organizational level could Im impact our ability to truly be agile at the system and team level. So let's, what we're going to do next, I'm going to go back over. I'm going to give you all a different link. Um, let me alt tab here. Um, let me close out of this poll. And we are going to go to this view. I'm going to click this and I'm going to get rid of that and get rid of that. And let me get you all another link here. So what we're going to do now, so if you want to uh, we need some people to play along. So if you click the new link that's in the in the chat. And um, what we've done here is these are what we call um, that there's 27 agile outcomes within Path to Agility. And I'm going to have you assess uh, your company in a couple of these areas. So um, I've gone ahead and opened voting. We're looking at an agile outcome called Compelling Purpose. And so this is about that we have a clear reason for like, why are we doing this thing? Why, you know, and, and again, the goal, if you say the goal is to implement safe, then I would say not met is, 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 is there isn't a compelling purpose. Like what's the reason behind that? And so you have five choices at the bottom, not met, slightly met, partially met, mostly met, fully met on uh, do you have a compelling reason why the organization should change? As we go through and kind of gather this information, you're going to gather a couple things. One, uh, a self-assessment for yourself. So you might note where you're rating yourself low because that's going to identify some opportunities for your organization on actions that you could take to remedy that. Um, but you're also going to get some data on where are other organizations and how do you compare. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, close this one out. Um, so we see um, uh, mostly partially met here, um, but uh, one organization at most uh, fully met and one at mostly met. So that's great, um, but a few in slightly met. So without a compelling purpose for change, we tend to see that things could stall or it's hard to get the leadership alignment because they don't even know why we're doing it. And it's hard to get the team alignment because they don't know why we're doing it. Right. Like, how do we get people engaged? 
So that's something to think about around that one. Um, let's we're going to skip around a little bit. Let's do this one. Let's do uh, products define that we have clear products and and like how we deliver value um, within within the work that we do. Um, and it's in and there's a clear driver, like there's a purpose behind the value. And, and, and this helps us determine how we're going to form kind of even align our arts maybe towards these products. So do we have a good product definition within um, our organization? So let's see how we do on this one. I'm going to wrap this up in 10, 9, or 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Okay. So uh, again, kind of in the middle, but when missing a fully met on this one. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and give ourselves a, a well, we'll stick with the slightly met on that one. Nice um, the next one is what we call value alignment. So this would be something that typically comes out of like a, a value stream mapping type of activity that we have clarity of how our uh, system of teams should be organized um, around value, that we got the right teams working together in an art. Um, we've minimized outside dependency. So the art is as self-sufficient as it can be. And the art is a cross-functional set of teams, right? So they're, they, they, we've got everybody uh, within that. So let's see how we're doing on value alignment as an agile outcome. And I see four of 10 answers in there. So give a couple seconds. All right, now we're, oh, there we got a bunch. All right, closing in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, so a little, not as good on this one. So we're, we still have a few, our strongest is partially met, but now we have some not met, slightly met. And this is one of the most critical things to get right early. Right. Otherwise, we implement an art on top of existing structure, and it's not really shifting a whole lot of behaviors. And we're 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 still got a lot of the same kind of crazy dependency management stuff on there. Um, so something to think about around that one. Um, let's jump over to team empowerment. So y'all were talking about leaders. Um, so this is about our leaders shifting their behavior to, oh, let me open voting, uh, shifting their behavior to actually let go and let the teams start to take ownership, right? So are, are leaders actually empowering their teams? Um, are they creating the space for the teams to step into? Um, are they creating an environment for the teams to be successful in a more self-organizing way and the system to operate in a self-organizing way? So let's see how we're doing on this one. And, five. Yeah, and a good one on, on here is thinking, you know, are they doing things like setting intent and making that clear so that so that teams can make good decisions? Are they empowered to actually make the decisions once they have the information? Things like that are really important to uh, when you're scoring these. Yeah, cool. All right. Oh, okay. That'd be so good. We, so I like I like the uh, three mostly Mets. That's maybe our strongest on that side, but we also have some room for improvement in some organizations. We're going to change that one to partially met. Um, and all right, so a couple more here. Value delivery coordinated. So this is uh, assuming we got an art launched, right? And the and the art is coordinating, like we've got good scrum of scrums communication, the product owners are in sync. Um, we're doing good, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, re retrospectives at, at that higher level um, and, and figuring out how to improve, right? We're managing those dependencies, those types of things are happening. We're learning as an art on, on getting better um, and coordinating the work that's happening. So let's see. Now we do on this one, uh, five, four, three, two, one. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay, we got, this one's maybe the most diverse of, a, of, of answers. Um, and uh, so still got some parsleys, but uh, two on the not met side. Um, so again, Part of that maturity of the art as we start to implement it and starting to put those practices in place 
um, are, you know, it's basically, are we developing the capability for us to be able to coordinate work at that level? And so that's what, you know, you know, what I'll highlight here, what we think is important to assess is, are we developing the capability to manage handoffs and dependencies, not are we showing up for meetings, right? And that's what we see a lot of times. It's like, we're doing all the things, like we, we have a scrum of scrums, check. We have a PO sync, check. And it's like, but are we actually coordinating in an effective way? That's what we want to assess, right? So we're just giving you a kind of a different lens to, to look at. We're going to do one more um, ability to focus. Uh, so this is one we have at the predict stage. So um, leaders are articulating value and sequencing the work at the appropriate level and then allowing the next layer or the system, the art, to pull and decompose. So this would get into things like lean portfolio management, are we actually creating focus as an organization um, and creating clarity of, and we use the term sequence instead of just prioritize, because we know if we go to our senior leaders and say prioritize, they're just gonna come back with everything's priority one. So we say, all right, we got a sequence. What's the first thing, the second thing, the third thing? Yeah, I would also say in here from a safe perspective, are we linking our Kanbans? Do we understand some cascading priorities and are we considering local context? But in so doing, are we actually limiting our whip? Because we can't be doing all of the things. We don't want to have five number one priorities. So uh, are, are we really uh, creating that environment at, at each of those levels to, to create that focus? All right. So um, we still, we got, we've got some partially met, a not met, and a couple mostly met. So that's not too bad. All right, we're going to go ahead and pause here. We're going to cut this a little short, but what we're going to see out of that data, now we're going to see that in this map up here. And, um, and so see the five stages across the top, see the levels down the left. So what we've done is we went ahead and we, um, we, we've done some level of assessment at this at this high level. We call this the Agile Outcome Map, just to start to get a sense of like, all right, where are we? Where's the pain? And you know, we we normally would do this, you know, more thoroughly, like with all of the the different things. But it at least starts to point us towards, all right, products. You know, here's the orange, here's the yellow. Uh, we don't have anything green right now, um, and but. But again, if we said speed is our most important thing, then we can start to overlay and say, all right, if speed's what we're after and these things are not green, then it starts to give us clarity of what should we be focused on. So one of the hardest things with an agile transformation is there's so many things we could do. And, and, and that's what Eric said earlier. We can get overwhelmed with the big picture. We can get overwhelmed with the implementation roadmap. There's so many things we could do. There's so much training we could do. There's, uh, so the question is, what's the right next thing to do? And what we're trying to do with Path to Agility is kind of a sense-making mechanism to say, all right, where are we today? Where are we trying to go? What are the right next steps? And so this starts to help us highlight okay, here's areas that we might want to focus on. We also can look at these arrows, right, to say if we want team empowerment, but we don't have good value alignment, then, then maybe team empowerment isn't the right, we, we want to get this to green, we want to get ability focused to green, but in order to get that to green, we got to get this other dependency chain to green as well. So it actually is, is saying team empowerment's maybe our finish line we want to get to green, but it's starting to highlight things that we might need to do prior to that. Now, each of these things that we're looking at, these uh, agile outcomes on this map, break down into more detailed capabilities. There's 100 capabilities underneath this map. Um, think about parent-child kind of relationship underneath here. Here's three capabilities that roll up to value delivery coordinated. So within value delivery coordinated, do we have cross-team coordination? And again, here's how we would assess at a capability level that we're developing the ability to coordinate as across team across teams. Here's uh, uh, do we have the capability that the system is taking ownership of their function, their improvement, right? How would we assess that? 
And then do we have the ability to measure at the system level or at that art level? So that's just one example of kind of digging in deeper into one of those agile outcomes into this kind of sub level of capabilities. And I'm going to I'm going to flip over to a data set that has more data in it. And um, what we see over here is that we we took a snapshot over a few quarters of an organization going through its transformation and started off very red, right? Like we're at the beginning, we're trying to do all this stuff. Um, and but over time, as we started to do more work, and I just kind of advanced this through a couple quarters, you see like some more green starts to show up. You see more yellow. Um, and you can see these trend lines within these. And within like value delivery coordinator, we can drill in and see, all right, it's at 33% because the cross-team coordination and ability to measure capabilities are only at 25% and system ownership is at 50%. So it starts to give us that ability to start to track our progress. And again, uh, this one has predictability, but let me, whoop, not that one, let me grab speed here. Um, if I Great do the thing as a coach too, team. like, uh, yeah. you know, as a coach, I can go in here. I've got, I've got a, a great visual that I can engage leadership with, have a conversation. I've got measures. I've got real data that I can lean on that, that are tied to our business outcomes. And I've got clear things I can go take action on that are going to have a, have an impact, which is great as a, as a coach in the field. So, um, Couple more slides here, and then we'll turn over to Q&A. So if you've got uh, any questions that are surfacing, go ahead and get those added to the Q&A panel down at the bottom. Um, but the, the last couple things here, when we look at that picture, what we wanna think about is there's also a really critical part that is about managing the organizational change, right? Thinking about organizational change management techniques and are we creating a compelling purpose for change? Are we building a team that is removing impediments quickly? Are we creating a capacity for continuous improvement in the organization? Um, and we wanna look at things at, at multiple facets when we're thinking about an agile transformation, not just are we applying all those practices that like, like the art level practices, what we would call here system agility, not that we're just doing scrum at the team level, which we call team agility, not that we're just doing the DevOps things within technical agility, but also are we thinking about the portfolio? Are we thinking about the leadership shift? Are we thinking about the organizational shift that's happening? So we want to think about all of those different dimensions uh, when we think about an agile transformation. And Path to Agility helps us start to visualize each of those areas and areas that we might need to uh, focus on. So let's just last close with kind of how does Path to Agility kind of fit with SAFE um, and, um, and how it complement, how we see that it complements. So you got this one, Eric? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, so I, this kind of ties back to our conversation in the beginning, right? Like we have all of these different approaches. So this is really framework agnostic. There's lots of frameworks out there. It's great. It, it works with safe. It works with scaling things. It also works in smaller organizations, but we have all of these different approaches. Um, all of those different approaches, though, need to be creating new capabilities that you can measure within your organization. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. It's sort of the veneer of agility. Uh, and so Path to Agility really helps you understand on all of those different dimensions, are we actually creating new capabilities? And then are those capabilities then tied to the ultimately the, the business outcomes that are, are measurable things that are making our, our business uh, more resilient going forward? So um, if I missed anything there, David, no, feel that's free to good. Tie in. Um, last thing. Yeah, and, and and this really is is kind of just uh, an overlay again on the 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 different uh, stages through Path to Agility and how they align with the uh, with Safe's uh, implementation roadmap and thinking about getting getting started early on. Of course, we need to align. That came up as a early question uh, or or problem that was identified by one of you. Um, creating that alignment. Um, moving into how, how are we learning together as a, as a team and a team of teams? How are we becoming more predictable so that ultimately, again, we can move forward with uh, a faster pace uh, to achieve our outcomes? 
So cool. So that's the uh, content that we have today. Just kind of starting to look at how path to agility and safe um, are, you know, com the compatibility and how we think when we think about path to agility on top of safe, right, and all of those practices as a way to orient to the why um, and to help us assess the capabilities that we're doing versus just kind of assessing the practices that we're doing. So uh, with that, if there's any uh, questions that anybody has, um, feel free to drop them into the Q&A panel and um, we'll switch into that mode. I think I see one in here, but I think it was written during the poll. Um, so, doo -doo -doo. any questions for us today? Kind of, we're ready. We're here. Free consulting, free stump, stump the coach. You know, yeah, it looks like there's one in here. The organization I'm with possibly not understanding the technical opportunity with agility or Scrum or Lean or anything related to it. Um, so, I think again, part part of where this is helpful is we we're not necessarily starting. Well, we are explicitly not starting with the, the, the practices that sit underneath it. So if you want to just get into Scrum and the sort of mechanisms of things, um, you're, you're going to lose leadership, especially if, if you're not a software company or that's, if that's not your thing. Um, so starting with the business outcomes, those are things that leaders in any business will care about. Those are things that are important to, to growing and sustaining any business. Yeah. Um, another question came in. Any lean portfolio management related outcomes inside of Navigator? And yeah, we, we touched on it just briefly in the uh, that ability to focus agile outcome, but the capabilities that we drill into there are smack dab in that space around lean portfolio management um, in terms of uh, how we're how we're implementing kind of sequencing at that level. Um, but again, a way to assess the capability of, all right, we're, we're implementing some lean portfolio management things. Is it actually helping us to deliver, you know, creating focus in the organization, limiting whip at, a, at, a, at an organizational scope per level, um, creating a pull system down, as, as Eric said, kind of con connecting the Kanbans, if you will. Um, that, yep. So definitely, yes, um, it's connected in there. All right, a couple more questions have come in. Oh, all right, we're getting them now, Eric. Yeah, uh, let's just tag team. You grab one, and I'll grab one. Okay, so how do you help leaders be patient through the dip in the learning curve? Um, th that's a tough one. I don't know that there's any any you know perfect or necessarily right answer to that, but I think explaining um, why that curve exists, what's actually happening there, and that that you know when people the, the rules of the game are changing and people are learning. Um, and, and that's that's difficult to get through that. Um, and I think if you focus on all of the problems and, and what's going on, it, then it, it, it gets it's challenging to get out of there. And so I think focusing the conversation on, okay, we want to get out of this dip. We want to be moving up into a better status quo going forward. So let's get focused on the right things to be doing um, and let's get leadership engaged in removing organizational impediments and all of the things that are keeping us from, from moving back out of there um, and actively engaging modeling behavior and things like that. So I think focusing it on what do we do to get out of it rather than why are we here is, is one way. Yeah, cool. And then uh, how do you report out when finance is still based on projects? So. Um, so I think this is where getting clear about the business outcomes and the success criteria of those business outcomes can help, right? Because, um, you know, often we are doing a transformation and there's some kind of constraints, right? And I'll just, you know, and one of those often is how we have traditionally financed things, right? So how we're maybe budgeting for things, how we're communicating in that way. And that's a constraint. And so if we can show, what I would encourage you to do is show how doing that is causing 
tension with the ultimate goal, right? Like financing in this way is keeping us from being able to optimize for speed potentially, right? And being able to connect the dots of where, where is it causing friction that is potentially slowing us down? Where is it causing friction in that it's not encouraging us to get a small, you know, potentially shippable product, small value out the door early because we're just shooting for the, you know, the big bang kind of budget or how we're staffing because we're only got short-term financing isn't allowing us to hire for long-term kind of staffing solutions. There could be all sorts of symptoms that occur. So being able to tie back, um, you know, th there's always a reality of when we are transforming an organization, we are going to be uh, wagile before we're fully agile, right? If we're going from waterfall to agile, there's going to be a period of time when it's going to be hybrid and messy, right? And one of those common things is that we're still doing finance in a, in a traditional way, right? And, and we've got to chip away at helping the finance organization uh, see that. And so like, uh, I don't know, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, part of that Southwest story was like them being able to say, all right, first, we've got to change how we're working. We've got to get our business more engaged. And then eventually they went to say, okay, finance, now that we can deliver in a more predictable way, we would like to actually change how we're funding things. And because we have the business as partners at the table making all of our decisions, they the finance group trusted them more as opposed to if they would have started right out of the gate and said, our business still doesn't like us, but let us fund our, you know, like change our funding model, right? Like, so there's things that we got to chip away at to be able to get the, the trust to be able to make some of those changes. So we've got another one for release, releasing to production and, and, and releasing once a month. Um, I, on this one, I guess I would, I would say looking at the outcomes, if, um, if maybe quality is, is your North star, maybe, maybe it's okay that you're, you're only releasing once a month and, and, you know, maybe that's not as, as important to your customer. I'm guessing that's not the case, or you probably wouldn't have asked this question. Um, but I think if you go back to like, well, what, what is our customer expectation? What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? What business outcome are we looking for? Um, and, assessing our ability to to meet you know if speed to market is the thing and we're only putting stuff out there once a month uh being able to go in and assess where we're being held up and then take action on it. so maybe maybe in in our practices we don't have a devops strategy maybe we don't have test automation strategy and those are things that are missing and we need to pull the people in who are concerned, you know, maybe our, our ops group is, is concerned with, well, we're only releasing month to month for the following reasons. Okay, well, let's have that conversation. Let's hear them out, understand what constraints they're working within, look at the ultimate goal of where we want to be and just start to craft a plan forward. Um, that's a tough one. It, it, it definitely, that, that'll take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a serious uh, investment. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I always think about like what feedback loop are we optimizing for when you talk about yeah re release versus you know is it is it actually on in production or not? Um, is to say all right, there's a feedback loop of a quality feedback loop, right? Like we're we built something and we we're te we're getting testing feedback, like running our test cases, and the more automation, the faster we we get that feedback, right? But then there's a feedback loop with our customer, and I put it in quotes because a lot of times our customer might be an internal business stakeholder and it's not actually the true user of the system. So it's really a proxy for the customer. And that is feedback and it's valid, but it's not true feedback of our customer. And then there's that feedback of, all right, we actually turned it on in production and we're getting feedback from the, the customer or the market, right? And um, and so the question is, what are we optimizing for and what are we trying to get? And sometimes we need to improve in each of those areas in sequence before we can actually do the latter. Um, and, and it goes back to your goals. If the goal is we want to be highly 
we just want to deliver stuff fast speed or is our goal to be more responsive to the market if we want to be more responsive then getting something that they can give us feedback on might be more important right um or is it that we have quality issues and we're trying to protect against that right which so so again it goes back to what's the why what's the thing that we're trying to optimize for right now one last quick one on this i i would also say that uh in safe the uh, system demos are a forcing function for this as well, right? So if we understand what our customer is looking for and we're trying to um, do integrated um, demos and, and releases on a regular basis um, and we are unable to do that, we pull the leaders into the room, have that conversation around, here's, our, here's what our customer is expecting or this is what outcome we're trying to get to. And as you can see, we're not able to. So using that as a as a way to drive investment in those um, in the pivoting in those practices to the right place. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, thanks for the interaction and thanks for the good questions um, that we received. We will be sitting out um uh email follow-up with a, a link to the recording um and uh and let us know if you have any other questions we'd be happy to answer them